Hi, thanks for joining us for our midweek Bible study here at Family of God Community Church. Sometimes it's moments of brokenness which create the greatest transformations. Times where fear gives birth to faith, pain leads to healing, and chaos dissolves into peace. It's in these times we often see God more clearly. For in our deepest turmoil, He remains faithful. When our spirit is crushed, He remains strong. When our moment is too heavy, He carries the burden. As gold is refined by fire, we too are often refined by struggle. It's part of growing, changing, becoming. Lately, the journey has been difficult. Our breath has been labored. Our steps uneasy. But we stand in faith knowing who is leading us through this desert. The God of peace, the God of hope, the God of restoration. Hi, thanks for joining us as we start this new series called Running on Empty. Many times in our lives we find ourselves wore out physically, emotionally, spiritually, and we need a fresh start. We need something to revitalize us. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about how Jesus revitalizes your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening and for this time that we share together. May you bless us as we look into your holy word. May you encourage our hearts, and Lord Jesus, may you be lifted up and glorified for all the wonderful things you do for us. For we give ourselves in this time now unto you, in Jesus' name, amen. How Jesus revitalizes your life. <clears throat> the disciples had just been through the most traumatic event in their lives. They had watched from a distance and seen their Savior, Jesus Christ, crucified on the cross. It was a devastating blow to them. Just a few days before that, Jesus had told them he was going to die, but they had difficulty understanding it. But as it began to sink in, they were deeply troubled. And that's where in John chapter 14, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And there we learned a number of things about the nature of Christ's great love for us and how he has prepared for us a home in heaven that we might be with him one day where he is. But with that background and them actually seeing him die on the cross, they had been through a myriad of emotions. As a matter of fact, uh, they assumed that someone had actually stolen Jesus' body. Peter and John after being prompted by Mary that as she ran to them and said, they have taken our Savior, they ran to the tomb. And of course, you know how <clears throat> the scripture says that Peter ran in and, and John looked in and they realized that Jesus was not there. Now, Mary had an encounter with Christ and she knew that he was risen from the dead, but the disciples had struggled with that. They had not personally seen him. So, a few days after the resurrection, Jesus came to the disciples and he did seven things that revitalized their lives. He really lifted them up, encouraged them. He gave them a full tank of spiritual gas, so to speak, so that they could really go out and turn the world upside down. Now, those seven things that Jesus did for the disciples back then, he does for you and I today. So let's look, if we would, at these seven things Jesus does to revitalize our lives when we're worn out, run down, and don't have any more power. First of all, he meets us where we are. The disciples had gathered in a room. Uh, they were behind locked doors because they 
felt that they were in danger because they had just crucified their master. What's to keep them from coming and taking them and crucifying them? And so they were not <clears throat> out in the general public. And we pick this story up in John chapter 20 after the resurrection. The Bible says it was late that Sunday evening and the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors because they were afraid of the authorities. And then the scripture says, then Jesus came and stood among them. Now we know uh, from other accounts that are given at this particular event that Jesus actually passed through the door. He passed through the walls. Uh, he came right into their presence. But the thing about this that is significant is that they were behind locked doors. The scripture says they were afraid. Have you ever been afraid? And the Bible says Jesus came to them and stood among them. Jesus meets us where we are. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what circumstances you're facing in your life. When you look at Jesus Christ and how he can revitalize your life, he will meet you where you are. And that's important for us to remember. The scripture says in Acts chapter 17, verses 26 and 27, it's a really great statement from the scripture. It says, from one man, he, God, has made every nation of humanity to live all over the earth. He has given them the seasons of the year, the boundaries with which they live. He has done this so that they would look for God, somehow reach for him and find him. In fact, the scripture says, he is never far from any one of us. This is an important statement in the scripture. Jesus meets us where we are. He knows where we live. He knows the circumstances of our life. He knows when we need him most. And dear friend, if you're going through a very difficult time right now, don't look too far. He's right there. He knows exactly what you're going through. And he meets us exactly where we are. Just like he entered that room where the disciples were in their great fear, in their great disappointment and discouragement, he met them where they were. The second thing that happens is he gives us peace. When you realize that he's meeting you where you are, one of the first evidences of that is the peace that passes all understanding. It just goes through us. And when we look at the Word of God, it tells us about how that peace comes when Jesus entered that room, he knew they were afraid. He knew they were uh, absolutely stricken with grief and pain. And so when he entered into the room, the first words that came out of his mouth was this, peace be with you. He wanted them to understand that they needed to have his peace and he wanted them to be at peace with him. The word for peace there in the Greek is the word irene, which means to be at complete rest. Be at rest within your spirit and your heart. The word literally means to become one again. Because you see, when we're uh, caught up in grief, when we're caught up in fear, when we're caught up in circumstances of life, our, our emotional aspects, our, our thoughts, they're torn apart. They're being pulled in different directions. But this word, irene, literally means that we are brought back into one again. So all of the things that are a part of our lives that are driving us apart, our struggling emotions, our physical feeling, the mental uh, difficulties that we're compounding in our hearts and lives through fear, it takes this. Jesus said, peace, irene. Be at rest and become one again. Let all of these things come together. In Philippians 4, I mentioned this a while ago. The scripture says, don't worry about anything, but pray and ask God for everything you need. Always giving thanks. And God's peace, which is so great that we cannot understand it. The peace that passes all understanding goes beyond it. It will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Very important to understand. When you pray to God, He is never far. He is right there. He meets us where we are. And He's offering peace to us. That peace comes to us when we stop worrying and we start praying. And we need to always go before Him with an attitude of gratitude. 
you may not be thankful for the circumstance that you're going into right now, but you can be thankful that God understands, He cares, and He will meet you where you are. And when you are grateful for that in your life, great things begin to happen. When they recognized Jesus and who He was, and they understood that He had a more power than they ever imagined that He had because He had resurrected from the dead, can you imagine the peace that flooded their hearts and minds? It was greater than the peace that came over them after Jesus stood up in the boat in the midst of the storm and said, Peace be still to the waves. And they had this calmness about them, I am sure. Now, in John chapter 14, Jesus had told them right before he was went to be crucified, he said, Listen, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. I'm leaving you with a special gift. You need to receive it. And he says, in this peace that I give, it isn't fragile like the peace the world gives. So don't be troubled or afraid. And yet here they were, afraid. Jesus gives us peace. So he meets us where we are, and he gives us peace. The next thing he does is he shows us his love. When you're going through a difficult time in your life or a difficult circumstance, maybe it's no fault of your own, or maybe it is your fault, because I know as an individual, we often make mistakes. We often say and do things we wish we had never said or done. But nonetheless, it does not matter. When Jesus is ready to revitalize you and you want to be revitalized, he meets us where we are. He first of all gives us peace. And then he shows us his love. Let's pick up the narrative here in John chapter 20. It says, As he spoke, he held out his hands for them to see. And he showed them his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw their Lord. He let them know, it's me, it's me, I'm the one that loves you. He had told them before he went away, he said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Then he said, Love others just as I have loved you. Jesus demonstrated his love by his crucifixion for us. And so the scripture says he demonstrated, he showed his love. As a matter of fact, um, we look at Paul, he would say it uh, in such a beautiful and eloquent way in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. He said, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Isn't that a beautiful statement? He demonstrated that love. He showed that great love for us. Then in Ephesians 3 and verse 18, the scripture says, and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. One of the reasons that many Christians do not get out of their depression, do not get out of their discouragement, do not get out of that mentality where they have found themselves uh, spiritually and physically and emotionally wore out is because they don't know how wide how long, how high, and how deep God's love is for them. He loves us. And because He loves us, He shows us that love. And when you begin to receive that love and understand that love and know that love, God begins to change your life. He begins to fill your tank again. He revitalizes your life. And so He meets us where we are. He gives us peace. He shows us His love. And then here's a big one. He offers us forgiveness. Often we feel spiritually apart from God because of sin. But I want you to understand, dear friend, just as He forgave your sin the moment that you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and by the way, He forgave your condition of sin, when, when God looks at you, all He sees is the pureness of Christ in your life. That's all He sees. But you and I, we get out of fellowship with God from time to time. And as we uh, walk through this life, we get filthy in our, in our life. We need our feet washed, <laughs> so to speak. It's a picture. But we need the forgiveness that God offers. And when Jesus was talking to the disciples, it's really neat to understand that shortly before he was crucified, he met in an upper room and he took a basin of water and he began to walk around the room and kneel before these disciples 
and he began to wash their feet. The, some of them were, oh, how? why are you washing our feet? And Jesus said, I need to wash your feet. If I don't wash your feet, you know, uh, it's, it's important for us to wash each other's feet. And that was the lesson. He said, the lesson here is not about washing feet and getting the dirt off the feet. The lesson is about forgiveness. He said, when I forgive you, I forgive you whole. I forgive everything. But as you walk through life, you pick up this sin you pick up. We live in a sinful world. And it's important that we forgive just as we have been forgiven. The point was that as Jesus washed their feet, he wanted them to understand, I have forgiven you. You are clean. Every bit of you is clean. But one of the things that we do not understand is how to forgive others. And he said, this is an important lesson for you to learn. You need to forgive one another. Numerous times in the New Testament, we read passages of scripture that talk about how we're supposed to forgive others. Even the apostles in the later books, they wrote that we need to forgive others just as Christ has forgiven us. And so as we look at forgiveness, it was significant. In John chapter 20 and verse 23, there in that room where they were gathered together, the Bible here says that Jesus spoke to them and said, if you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. Forgive them. That word forgive means to release from debt. And so they no longer owe a debt to you. And so if you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. And then he says this, if you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? <laughs> Think about that. What are you going to do with that sin? You hold on to it. They did me wrong. They did something bad to me. And you just hold on to it. And you don't let it go. You just grab onto it. And Jesus said, if you don't forgive them, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with those sins that you held on to? What are you going to do with them? When he was teaching the disciples how to pray, he said, pray like this. He said, forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. And then after he had finished that, he said, and take this to heart. He said, if you forgive not others, their sins against you, neither will the Father in heaven forgive your sins. And it was a hard, hard statement for them to accept. And so here Jesus puts it in a new way. He says, if you forgive someone's sins, they're gone. Released from debt. I'm no longer going to hold this over your head. Yes, it hurt. Yes, I'll have trouble forgetting how it hurt. But I need to forgive. I need to release them from debt. They don't owe me anything. It's done. It's forgotten. I'm, I'm moving on in life. But if you choose not to forgive with them, what are you going to do with that that you're holding on to? By the way, it doesn't hurt them. It only hurts you. I see people carry bitterness around like a badge, like it's something proud of in their life. I hate those people over there. I'll never forgive them. And they wear it like a badge of honor. And I have news for you, dear friend, if that's you, it's not a badge of honor. It's a badge of shame. And I ask you the question, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with it? And that's exactly what Jesus told the disciples. In Psalm 32, verse 1, the scripture says, What happiness or blessings for those whose guilt has been forgiven. What joys when sins are covered over. The blood of the Lamb of God covers our sins. What relief for those who have confessed their sins and God has cleared their record. You and I need to understand God wants us to live in happiness, in joy. Uh, he wants us to experience relief when we go through life. He offers us this wonderful forgiveness. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, Peter writes, Above all things, have intense and unfailing love for one another. Why? For love covers a multitude of sins. What does that mean? It means it forgives and disregards the offenses of others. You say, well, they hurt my feelings. Well, bless your pee-picking heart. How many people's feelings have you hurt? The bottom line is, if you're going to hold on to that bitterness and let it turn to hatred and resentment and ugliness in your life, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? God offers us forgiveness. And we need to seek that forgiveness and live in it. And more importantly, we need to forgive other people. 
So he meets us where we are. He gives us peace. He shows us his love. And he offers us forgiveness. Here's my favorite one. Number five, he fills us with his presence. I love this. He fills us with his presence. In John 20 and verse 22, he's standing there with them. He's been telling them all these things. And he says this, Then Jesus breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. See, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. He breathes the Spirit within us, so to speak. We are immersed with the Holy Spirit of God, and His presence is ever with us. The Scripture says that He is our earnest, our, our guarantee, our promise. He will never leave us, and we'll look at that in just a minute. The Scripture says that when you have this Spirit of God, His presence deep within you in 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul told young Timothy, the spirit that God has given us does not make us timid. Instead, his Holy Spirit fills us with power, love, and self-control. So we have this power, this spirit within us. Back before they were to be uh, separated by the crucifixion, Jesus told the disciples, if you love me, obey me, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter. That word comforter in the Greek is the word paraclete. It means one who comes alongside. And the scripture says this, and you need to underline this in your Bible, or if you have the notes, underline it. He will never leave you. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and he gives you the Holy Spirit, which he does at the point that you receive Christ, he will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who leads into all truth. In other words, you can't receive Jesus Christ apart from the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And then when you do receive Christ into your life, you receive the Holy Spirit and He will never leave you. He is a part of your existence for the rest of life. He meets us where we are. He gives us peace. He shows us love. He offers forgiveness. He fills us with his presence. God's presence is right there. We just need to draw on it. So many times we forget that he is here. He is with us. The sixth thing he does for us is he gives us a new purpose. So many times the reason that we are so uh, discouraged, despondent, upset, empty, is because we've forgotten our purpose in life. Now, he gives us a new purpose. And in John 20 and verse 21, Jesus said again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I now send you. In other words, God had a plan. He had a mission for Jesus. And he has a plan and a mission for you and for me. He has something he's already prepared for us to do. And we need to be about that mission. We need to be about telling others the good news. We need to be about encouraging others to receive Christ. We need to be about inviting people to come to church and to hear the Word of God. In Philippians 2 and verse 15, uh, we read this statement. Uh, it says, Go into the world uncorrupted like a breath of fresh air in a squalid and polluted society. Boy, that's a beautiful imagery. P provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God and carry the light-giving message into the night. You must shine among them like stars lighting up the sky. Isn't that a cool thing? That's what we are as far as God is concerned. We are the ambassadors of heaven. We are the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And we carry the light-giving message, the gospel, into the night. And we shine like stars lighting up the sky. Isn't that a beautiful description of how God views us? We have a purpose. God has a plan for us and a purpose. And we're just filling that small niche of so many stars that are in the sky. We're one of them. You are one of them. And we need to all be about that purpose of God. I said there were seven things. He meets us where we are. He gives us peace. He shows us his love. He offers us forgiveness. 
He fills us with his presence and he gives us a new purpose. The last thing is this. He helps us believe. The disciples that were gathered in the room at that time, there was one who was missing from among them. Uh, he was not there at that time. And so Thomas was the one who was not there. And he said, uh, you know, I've got to have more than just your word on this. And of course, let's pick up the story there in John chapter 20, beginning in verse 24. It says, now Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my hand into his side wound, I will not believe it. A week later, the disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Here he is. He comes back in again. Peace, love, forgiveness, presence, purpose, all these things. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. And then he says this, Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. You know, there's no indication in the scripture that Thomas reached out and touched. <laughs> he knew. He knew the moment that that had occurred. In John 20 and verse 29, the conclusion of all this seven steps of revitalization, Jesus said this, You believe, these disciples, because you've seen with your own eyes even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. Let me ask you a question, dear friend. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You believed even without seeing. Just as Jesus entered into your life and gave you that new birth, that new life, He stands ready to revitalize your life. He stands ready to fill your tanks. He stands ready to put you back where you need to be. All you've got to do is believe. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your great kindness and love. We thank you for your great compassion that you demonstrate upon us. Thank you for revitalizing our lives in those times when we need it most. Lord, there are those out there right now that are struggling. They're struggling financially. They're struggling in relationships. They're struggling with circumstances beyond their control. Uh, they're struggling with health and other things. Father, I pray that in this very moment, you would meet them where they are. You would bring your peace and your love, that you would bring forgiveness and encouragement. You would bring your presence and purpose into their lives and help them to face the future believing, believing, knowing that you're there and that you're going to help them through this. I pray that for them, Lord. And dear friend, if you have been listening tonight and you don't know for certain if you died that you go to heaven, but you'd like to know, all you need to do is believe. When you believe, it means that I'm placing my faith in Jesus Christ. I believe that he died on the cross for me and he's buried and he rose again the third day. That is the gospel, the good news. And so if you would like to be forgiven of your sins and have a home in heaven one day with him, will you take this little step of faith and believe and just pray a prayer with me? Just bow your head right where you are and join me in a prayer. Just say, Lord Jesus, I want to be forgiven of all my sins. I don't want to carry any guilt in my life anymore. I want to be set free. And so, Lord Jesus, I place my future, my faith in your hands, believing that you died on the cross for me and shed your precious blood to forgive me and to wash me white as snow. And I believe that they took you down from that cross and laid you in a borrowed tomb but three days later, you gloriously and wondrously rose from the dead so that I can have a home in heaven with you one day. 
So, Lord Jesus, will you come into my heart and my life? Will you be my Savior to forgive me of all my sin, past, present, and future? Will you be my Lord to lead me and help me to make good and wise decisions? And will you be my friend to walk with me through no matter what I face here in this world, but one day walk the streets of heaven with you? And dear friend, if you prayed that prayer with me and you meant it with all of your heart, the scripture says, Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus and believes in their heart that God the Father raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so right now, when you prayed that prayer with me, you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let somebody know. Just uh, be encouraged in that. You need to share it with someone. If you don't have anybody you think you can share it with, you can share it with me. Just drop me a note there at Pastor Howard at familyofgodcc.com. I'd love to hear from you. Dear friends, thanks for joining us tonight in this new series. Uh, I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you, that the Lord will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, and that the Lord will lift his countenance upon you to watch over you no matter where you go. And as we leave this time together tonight, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, and as always, keep looking up. (laughs) 